this is Robin on the Road, your concierge for all things travel, and today I'd like to take you on the road with me to Albemarle County, Virginia, and Monticello, the home of third president Thomas Jefferson. Pack your bags, let's go! On a recent on-the-road trip to Charlottesville, Virginia, I had the pleasure of visiting Monticello, the home of our third president, governor of Virginia, writer of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. I've been to Monticello at least a dozen times in my life, but every time I am struck by the beauty of the home and the surrounding countryside. Once you purchase your ticket, you enter the David M. Rubenstein Visitor Center. There is a film, Thomas Jefferson's World, telling the role that Monticello played in his life. The Griffin Discovery Room has several interactive digital exhibits for children and adults alike. There is also a cafe and gift shop. To get to Jefferson's home, you board a bus at the top of the stairs for a two-minute drive to the house. You can walk up the trail to the home, but I have found that the trail is better returning to the visitor center. Your ticket will have your tour time on it. Do not miss your tour. While the house tour runs on a schedule, the grounds are at your leisure. Each location has information about its function and the people who work there. Plus, there are videos and scheduled talks about the gardens, shops, and slaves who made life possible at Monticello. The times for these talks are posted. Jefferson was born in Shadwell, Virginia on April 13, 1743. His father, Peter Jefferson, will pass in 1757, and 14-year-old Thomas will inherit the property. In 1770, Jefferson begins to build on the property, a two-story brick structure, 18 by 18, with living quarters on top and a kitchen below. And it is here, in 1772, he will bring his wife, 23-year-old Martha Wells Skelton, and it is also here where he will begin to plan and build the first version of Monticello. A man of the Enlightenment, Jefferson has a passion for architecture. He will call Italian architect Andrea Palladio's The Four Books of Architecture his architectural Bible. From the small house that is now the South Pavilion, Jefferson will build and change Monticello for most of his life. The Jeffersons will have six children, but only two that will live to adulthood. And it's after the birth of their sixth child, Lucy, that Martha Jefferson will pass in 1782. Before dying, she makes Jefferson promise that he will never marry again, a promise he will keep. Jefferson is devastated by the loss of his beloved wife. His daughter, Lucy, will die two years later. Paralyzed by his grief, in 1784, Jefferson will accept a post from Congress to Paris, first as trade minister, then minister to France. Jefferson will fall in love with European architecture, and the Monticello you see today is the result of that trip. Jefferson will take his eldest daughter, Patsy, and 19-year-old slave, James Hemings, whom he hoped would learn how to cook French cuisine. Later, they will be joined by his daughter, six-year-old Polly, and 14-year-old slave, Sally Hemings. The Hemings family had been inherited by Jefferson from his father-in-law, John Wales, who had fathered six children with Elizabeth Hemings, making them half-brothers and sisters to his wife, Martha. Sally is one of these children and seems to have resembled Martha. Had James and Sally Hemings stayed in Paris, they would have been free. However, before his return, Jefferson will have a guarantee with both. James will return to teach the French style of cooking to his brother Peter in the kitchen at Monticello. He will officially be freed in 1796, only to commit suicide in 1801. Sally, possibly pregnant, will make a guarantee with Jefferson, not for her own freedom, but for that of the children that she will bear him. They will have at least six children, with four growing into adulthood. What Sally negotiates for herself are special privileges. She takes care of Jefferson's room, sews, and most important, raises her children. The relationship does not go unnoticed, and the term concubine will be used to describe her. Is it possible that Jefferson was in love with an African-American woman? Historians and descendants of Jefferson and Sally Hemings have varying opinions on the relationship, but one thing is clear, Sally and her children were owned by Thomas Jefferson. Today, Sally's story is told as part of the Getting Word Oral History Project, began in 1993 and still ongoing. 
The project is a collection of stories that have been passed down through generations of families once enslaved by Jefferson. The Hemings, Fawcett, Gillette, Granger, Hearn, Coleman, Henderson, Shelton, and many more are part of the story of the enslaved people of Monticello. Sally's own story comes to Monticello from her children that she had with Thomas Jefferson. By embracing the history of the enslaved men and women, Monticello is able to give a much better glimpse into what life was like for these men and women. Talks on the slaves and the stories that were relayed by the families are given on Mulberry Road where slave cabins once stood. Check the times at the visitor center and house gardens. The 1809 remodel will add north and south wings. The south wing, which connects the all-weather passage to the south pavilion where Jefferson lived, contains the Granger Hemings kitchen found during a 2017 archeological excavation. At the request of his wife, Martha, Jefferson purchased Ursula Granger from his father-in-law. Her husband, George Granger Sr., will become the only African-American overseer at Monticello. They will have three sons, two will become blacksmiths and one a farm worker. Sadly, Ursula, George Sr., and George Jr. will die from a possible poisoning. The dairy was unique to a home at that time. Dining at Monticello included special treats like ice cream, hot chocolate, cheese, and apparently an enormous amount of butter. Slave women milked the cows and made the butter for the cooks for a few rooms down in the kitchen. While the rooms under the walkway are cooler, Jefferson also had an ice house and would experiment with refrigeration. The next two rooms were occupied by slaves. The first now holds the Getting Word story. The second holds a tribute to Sally Hemings, and it's thought that she lived here with her children by Jefferson. This room is located next to the smokehouse. The smokehouse was moved here in 1802 from Mulberry Road, and prior to refrigeration, animals would be brought here from Poplar Forest, Jefferson's plantation in Bedford County, Virginia, and processed in the winter. Beef was salted and brined in casks until needed. Pork would be salted and then smoked for preservation. Choice cuts were served upstairs while lesser cuts were for the slave. Next to the smokehouse is the cook's room. Peter Hemings lived in this room until he retired after 13 years as cook of Monticello. He was followed most likely by Edith Hearn Fawcett and her family. The contents of the room are based on Jefferson's records. Edith will share this 140 foot square space with her husband and eight children. We will cover her husband Joseph at the blacksmith shop. Edith Hearn was born to enslaved parents at Monticello and at 15 was taken to the White House to study French cooking under Henri Jouan, the White House chef. The last room in the southern wing is the kitchen, which was moved here by 1809 as Jefferson concluded his second term as president. The kitchen reflects Jefferson's desire for French cuisine and even contains a European stew stove which has several open, cast iron openings that temperature can be moderated in. Jefferson will return from France with 60 pots and pans made of copper and other specialized pieces. As we round the corner, the passageway is an excellent demonstration about how the South really felt about slavery. Everything was kept hidden. Even though people knew what made the economy of the South work, and it's through this passageway that we will learn the stories of some of the house slaves at Monticello. Priscilla Hemings was the property of daughter Martha Jefferson Randolph and her husband. Married to joiner John Hemings, she lived on Mulberry Row and was in charge of the grandchildren who were not in school. Burwell Colbert was the grandson of Elizabeth Hemings and inherited by Jefferson from his father-in-law. At the age of 10, he began working in the nail-making shop located on Mulberry Road. He will become Jefferson's enslaved butler and personal servant at when Jefferson retires in 1809, and will manage the housemaids, waiters, and porters, and be entrusted with the keys to the food, wine, and beer storage, the only enslaved person to be granted this.
Jefferson will pay Colbert $20 a year, and he is one of the 10 slaves granted his freedom in Jefferson's will. Working as an enslaved houseboy, Israel Gillette will work with Burrell Colbert by running errands, carrying wood and water, stoking the fires in the home. He is the driver of Jefferson's Landau carriage and will be sold after Jefferson's death in 1826. He will take on the surname Jefferson and purchase his freedom in 1840. From his ancestors, we will learn that he referred to Sally Hemings as Jefferson's concubine. Not surprisingly, along with the stories of the enslaved people, is the representation of Martha Randolph Jefferson, also known as Patsy. Plantations at this time would be run by women, as men were often gone from the house conducting business. This is a three mile an hour world, and a trip that is 30 miles away would take you three days to get to over poorly constructed roads. Also in the passage are Betty Brown and Harriet Hemings. Brown was known as Aunt Bet and was Burwell Colbert's mother and the first Hemings to arrive at Monticello in 1772. Harriet was likely the child of Sally Hemings and Jefferson. She was a seamstress and wool spinner. Per his agreement with Sally, she will leave at 21 and move to DC and pass into the white world. The location and coolness of the passageway make it ideal for the storage of food, beer, cider, and wine. Beer had been produced by Jefferson's wife, but in 1812, Captain Joseph Miller, a captured redcoat and British brewer, was brought to Monticello and produced ale, a more alcoholic form of beer. He taught Peter Jefferson, the enslaved French cook, to brew, and like his cooking, he had success. Jefferson will say Peter Hemings possessed great intelligence. Hemings will not be freed in his will, but sold, and it is thought that he worked as a tailor in Charlottesville, another of his skills. Jefferson's wine cellar reflects the tremendous passion he had. He will purchase wine from abroad, but will also practice viticulture, trying to find the best grapes for Virginia's soil and climate. Only Jefferson's daughter and a few entrusted slaves will have keys to the ware room and storage area. There are two very unique items in the passageway. The first is the wine demerator, operated by Burrell Colbert, and the second is a strange looking object, a glass cylinder with seven cannonballs inside. I will tell you more about these items on the house tour. The North Wing was built 30 years after the South and is very different in its use. Although indoor privies did not appear in homes until the 19th century, Monticello had three inside the home and two at the end of the South and North Passage. Slaves were paid gratuities to keep them clean. There was also a necessary located on Mulberry Row. The ice house was very important to life at Monticello. A cylinder 16 feet in diameter by 16 feet high located under the North Terrace. As many as 62 wagons could be brought up from the Ravana River during the winter by hired and enslaved people. The ice would be stored between hay and wood chips and last through the summer. This would allow for a type of refrigeration for meat and dairy products. Snow would be used to make ice cream. In 1819, snow from the ice house was used to put out a fire in the North Pavilion. Traveling during Jefferson's time was a slow, uncomfortable, and even dangerous prospect. Ever the inventor, Jefferson will design several of his carriages, including the lightweight Phaetons. He enjoyed driving fast. He used an odometer invented by Virginian James Clark as a favorite measure of mileage. The North Pavilion was used by Jefferson's son-in-law, Thomas Mann Randolph. The lower level was a bathhouse and then a washhouse. The pavilion will catch fire in 1819 and snow from the ice house will be used to prevent it from spreading to the main house. Today, there is an education room and a small cafe for drinks and snacks located at the North Terrace rest under the trees at a table and take a break. Finally, the time for our house tour is arrived. Line up outside the front of the house where the bus dropped you off. 
The Monticello you see today looks nothing like Jefferson's original. Under artisan James Dinsmore, construction begins in 1796, and Jefferson's records will reflect that he had 69 free and enslaved brickmakers, blacksmiths, carpenters, joiners, glazers, nailmakers, plasters, roofers, stonemasons, and painters. In 1809, having been trained by Dinsmore, slave John Hemmings will take over as foreman. The second story will be removed and the iconic dome will be finished in 1800. This is the first private dwelling in the U.S. to have one. As we enter the east front, notice the weather vane in the ceiling. It is connected to the one in the roof. Weather is a lifelong passion of Jefferson and he keeps detailed daily records. The clock is also double-sided. Entering the hall today is still impressive. At 18 feet 6 inches high, the hall was meant to impress and educate his guest. Getting to Monticello during Jefferson's time was an arduous and disliked task, as the mountain was over 800 feet high. Yet as many as 50 guests at a time would arrive. The hall was Jefferson's waiting room and lined with 28 chairs, so his guests could look upon his maps of South America, Africa, the colonies, and Virginia. Mastodon fossils found in Kentucky, and busts of French thinkers, antlers from moose, deer, elk, and bighorn sheep. In 1803, as president, Jefferson will purchase the imperial rights to land west of the Mississippi from France for three cents an acre. This will eventually double the size of America and become known as the Louisiana Purchase. Lewis and Clark will head off with the core discovery in 1804 in hopes of finding a water passage to the Pacific. Think of it as that day's moon landing. Friendship medals are given to the Indian tribes they encounter along the way. They will return three years later with volumes of information, specimens, and even a few Native American tribesmen to meet Jefferson. The hall is now full of reproductions from their expedition. The artistry in the Great Hall is incredible. Half moon windows, raised panel doors, beautiful crown molding. And remember those cannonballs we saw in the corner of the storage room? They are part of the Great Clock and are connected to a Chinese gong on the roof, which would go off hourly. The clock tells the time, but also the day of the week. Due to a miscalculation, Saturday had to be put below the floor into the storage room. Around the corner to the left, we enter what was once the book room, but post the sale of Jefferson's book collection will become the family sitting room. Martha Jefferson Randolph, Patsy, will teach her children. She has 12 from 1791 to 1818 in this room. She and the other women, plus four enslaved women, will try and keep up on the sewing and the mending at Monticello. During the War of 1812, the British will burn the White House, and that is where the Library of Congress is kept at that time. Struggling with his debts, Jefferson will sell 6,500 of his beloved books on a variety of subjects, and they will become the nucleus for the Library of Congress. Speaking of libraries, we now enter Jefferson's, and it will make up one of three rooms and the greenhouse that will be called his Sanctum Sanctoria. And it's in this room that Jefferson will draw up the plans for the University of Virginia. He orders an 1811 astronomical clock so he can keep accurate observations. And although deep in debt, he will collect another 2,000 books. The windows in this room and the one next door are from floor to ceiling so that he may step through onto a patio that he will call his greenhouse, where he will experiment with plants, even having success with citrus. The cabinet makes up Jefferson's bedroom and it's where his office is located. A gadget nut and inventor, he owned at least 35 scientific instruments, including terrestrial and celestial globes, drafting and surveying equipment, tel and telescopes. With volumes of correspondence, he received over 1,200 letters in 1820 alone. He will invent the polygraph, a two-pen copying machine making duplicates of some of the 19,000 letters he wrote. His joiners will make custom furniture like a desk with a revolving top or a revolving stand you can use whether seated or standing. His bed is at the center of the room and it's made specifically for him. A closet is at the foot of the bed and one of the indoor privies is at the head. 
Every morning, Jefferson would rise before dawn, make his own fire, and put his feet into a pan of ice water. To maximize light, he will use mirrors, but there is also an 18 and a half foot high skylight. It's in this bed on July 4th, 1826, that he will pass away, the same day as his friend, Second President John Adams. As you leave the bedroom and head into the parlor, notice the double doors as you enter. When you open one door, both will open, still working on the original 1805 mechanism. The parlor is where evenings were spent with family and guests. Jefferson called music the favorite passion of my soul, and he played the violin, estimating he had practiced 13,000 hours. His daughter Patsy would play the harpsichord and his granddaughters the guitar. As you enjoy the art, look at the crown molding around the room and the attention to detail above the door, the fireplace mantle, and the parquet floor. And don't miss the camera obscura, precursor to taking photographs, it would project an image on the wall. The last room on our tour is the dining room, and as you step in, let it take your breath away. Jefferson had it repainted in 1815, and chrome yellow was fashionable at the time. Twice a day, enslaved butler Burrell Colbert would ring the bell for mealtime. Breakfast was at 8 a.m. and dinner at 4. French cuisine with some Virginia additions was served. Most everything was from Monticello with some special items like olive oil, Parmesan cheese, and macaroni, Jefferson's word for pasta. As you head toward the exit, notice the silver that Jefferson had made, including the cup that bears his name. Also in the hallway is the family china. And if you turn around, there's a rotating door another access point where only Burrell Colbert would be seen by Jefferson's guests and the other slaves were unseen. Head out of the house toward the pond and Mulberry Row, a 1300 foot road of ever-changing dwellings where free and indentured whites lived along with free and enslaved blacks. The row was once lined with 25 dwellings, workshops, and storage buildings. The names of over 85 people are known. You are walking in their footsteps of the people who worked and lived here 200 years ago. Remains of four original structures and some created hint at their life. It is the product of more than 50 years of archaeology and study. I will walk Mulberry Road from east to west, making the first building we encounter the stable. Like Monticello itself, the stable will undergo at least three remodels. Consider a horse during Jefferson's time like your car today. Jefferson had a passion for horses and will find solace in their company after the death of his wife. He was a fearless rider, and almost up until the day he died, he will ride his property, his 5,000 acres, every day. His passion will carry over into breeding, using English bloodlines and Virginia horses. Sadly, during the Revolution, the British will carry off or outright kill his horses. He was, after all, a traitor. Caring for his horses, the groomer, or hostler, was someone Jefferson would trust. Jefferson had grown up at Shadwell with Jupiter, and he became his property when both men turned 21. Jupiter will make Jefferson angrier than the grandchildren had ever seen him before or after over who should ride a horse, but in the end, Jefferson will agree with him. After his death, Wormley Hughes, grandson of Elizabeth Hemings, will take over as head groom. Besides his beloved horses, the thing to remember is Monticello was a farm. Lacking in machinery, it relied on human and animal labor. Caring for all these animals must have been a full-time job, plus the animals who were raised for food and milk. Travel at this time was a difficult task. There were few roads, and the existing ones were often of poor condition. Yet life went on. Goods needed to reach markets and items not produced on the plantation purchased. Wagoneers were the semi-truck drivers of their day. Although slaves, they had autonomy on the road, even carrying money. Slave families were usually kept together on plantations because you would not run away and leave your family and you would return home to them. 
the next location on Mulberry Road were slave quarters. At one time, there was a large building that would house several families, but after a fire and as, as times changed, single-family dwellings were built. John Hemings most likely built slave quarters TRNS, and they will house individual Heming family units, including Sally and her children. Because of his status and skills, John Hemings earned a living. He and his wife Priscilla enjoyed a better living than most of the slaves, and their house reflects that. He could read and write, and Jefferson allowed for Bible reading and Christianity. The enslaved on Mulberry Road were skilled workers, and many made money on their skills, like John Hemings. But for unskilled laborers, living conditions were harsh. Slavery at Monticello Tours began at the Hemings Cabin. In his life, Jefferson inherited 187 slaves, purchased fewer than 20 mainly because of marriage, sold 110 enslaved, mostly due to debt. He will gift 88 enslaved, mostly as dowries, and after his death in two auctions, 126 men, women, and children will be sold. Beyond the livestock and crops were the weaving and textiles. During the Revolution, England conducted an embargo and cloth could not be purchased from them. Jefferson will employ enslaved women to spin cotton, hemp, and wool, and weavers to make it into cloth. His only surviving daughter by Sally Hemings, Harriet, learns the textile trade and enters into the white world at the age of 21 for his agreement with Sally with this skill. Enslaved children at the age of 10 will be put to work, boys making nails and girls spinning. Those who are unsuccessful will be put to work in the fields. Although the work may seem less arduous than field labor, women work 9 to 14 hours a day here. In 1811, Jefferson has a 24 spindle spinning jenny built and it will work like 24 spinning wheels. The next dwelling on Mulberry Road was a slave cabin, and the building next to that was a wash house until it was moved to the South Pavilion Cellar in 1809. A stone house was built there to house a slave family, and today the remains of that building tell the story of the Levi family. Uriah Philip Levi was the first Jewish American to receive the rank of Commodore in the U.S. Navy. He will purchase Monticello in 1834 to preserve it. Had he not, Monticello likely would have been destroyed by time. In 1862, he will try and give the home to the government, only to be turned down. His nephew, Jefferson Monroe Levi, will gain title to the house and will sell the home and 662 acres to the newly formed Thomas Jefferson Foundation in 1920. Their dedication for nearly 90 years is why we have Monticello today. The walls of the stone house will be taken down by Uriah to form a wall around his mother's grave. This spot was the location of the original smokehouse and dairy from 1790 until 1809 when it will be moved to the newly finished South Terrace. The next building is a reproduction for the storehouse for iron and part of the forge and quarters of Isaac Granger, who will work as a blacksmith, tinsmith, and nail maker here. Isaac will master all three trades and will belong to three different family members before gaining his freedom and moving to Petersburg, Virginia in 1820. He will take on the surname Jefferson. His memoirs of his life at Monticello will be published in 1847. In 1794, Jefferson will set up a nail-making operation. His nailry will produce thousands of pounds of nails sold to local shops and neighbors. The nail makers were nine enslaved boys ages 10 to 15, standing at anvils making up to 10,000 nails a day. From 1775, free and enslaved workmen produced some of the most beautiful woodwork in Virginia. Sawyers felled trees, carpenters dry and rough cut planks, and joiners using hand tools create furniture and furnishings, carriages, floors, doors, and moldings, making up the wood trades, carpenter, and joiner shop. Today, the chimney and foundation of that shop are all that exist. Before we finish with Mulberry Row and head toward Jefferson's grave, we need to talk about his amazing gardens. The terrace garden, which lies behind a thousand foot retaining wall, was a grand experiment. Jefferson will keep meticulous notes on seeds sown and plants harvested. Of the 330 species of herbs, vegetable, and fruit, many were new to the American garden. Things like eggplants, artichokes, broccoli, cauliflower, and peanuts. 
Peaches were Jefferson's favorite, but his orchard grew figs, apples, cherries, pears, plums, and nectarines, even a vineyard. His ornamental garden along the winding walk is beautiful. He will research and correspond with botanists and nurserymen from around the world, collecting and sharing seeds. Because of these meticulous notes, the Jefferson Foundation has been able to recreate his gardens. The garden tours meet several times a day out by the pond. Times are posted throughout Monticello. The path from Mulberry Road leads us to the final resting place for Thomas Jefferson. As a boy, Jefferson and his best friend Dabney Carr will study the oak tree and make a pact that whoever dies first will bury the other there. Jefferson is faithful to his pact when he buries Dabney, who passes in 1773 at the age of 30. Jefferson will pass on July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration. His epitaph leaves us with one more glimpse into the man, as he omits being Governor of Virginia and President of the United States. The cemetery is owned by his descendants. The tour bus will pick you up at the cemetery for a ride back down the mountain, but the walking path down the hill is easy and delightful. Today, Monticello is a thriving tourist destination. The Thomas Jefferson Preservation Society has recreated not only Jefferson's world, but given a much better understanding of plantation life in Virginia. From Jefferson's extensive notes and the incredible archaeology began in 1957 that still goes on today, through recreations and the discovery of new sites, 750,000 items have been found on Mulberry Row alone, and they tell a story of a community of people whose story can also be told through the Getting Word Oral History Project began in 1993, so that the descendants of these people become more clear. And what I have found are some of the most talented, skilled, and ingenious people. Over the winter, from 2000 to 2001, archaeologists will locate an African-American graveyard in the parking lot at Monticello. Originally, 20 graves were located, with 8 being children. Today, 40 graves have been confirmed, and even though we know the names of Monticello's enslaved, the identity of those buried here are unknown. The graves were not disturbed during the archaeology, and more sites have yet to be discovered. Today, Jefferson is as polarizing as he was during his time, and we struggle with the man who will write those famous words, all men are created equal, and yet he will own slaves, including his own children. And while Jefferson was not able to live up to those words, nor the men of that time, I'd like to hope that what they did was lay down a path so that we might be a better country, a better people, and we should ask ourselves if we are living up to those words today. And if not, maybe we can view Jefferson through a broader lens, for he was an inventor, meteorologist, architect, horticulturalist, viticulturalist, writer, theologian, musician, horse breeder, botanist. His mind I never stop being curious about life, and maybe that's something we can learn from him. Things to know before you go. Monticello is open every day except Christmas and Thanksgiving, with hours running seasonally. Ticket prices at the time of this video were $32 for adult, 10 for children 12 to 18, and 12 and under is free for the self-guided tour. I have visited Monticello more than a dozen times in my life, and I can tell you that the self-guided tour is a bit disappointing. If this is your first time, pay the extra and upgrade to the behind-the-scenes day pass. I recommend a minimum of four hours to see the house, grounds, visitor center, movie, and exhibits. Monticello is an excellent family-friendly location with a lot of interactive and recreated history. Mobility impaired can be accommodated. I recommend purchasing tickets ahead of time, especially during the busy summer months. There are two cafes located on the property, one at the visitor center and one up on the hill. Don't miss the gift shop where you can purchase all things Jefferson, including some of his plants. For this on-the-road trip, I chose to stay at the Holiday Inn Express. It was clean, quiet, and close to Monticello. Breakfast is not included, but can be purchased for under $10 when you make your reservation. Downtown Charlottesville is a closed-off street for shopping, dining, and entertainment. For this on-the-road trip, I ate at Jack Brown's, a fantastic, strictly burger and beer joint. Try the Greg Brady. If you have the time, hike the Saunders 
Monticello Trail up the mountain to Monticello. Stop at Mitchie's Tavern for fried chicken or Jefferson's Vineyard for some wine and a spectacular view. I will provide links in my description. I will also have follow-up videos on all of these places, so stay tuned! Lastly, I would like to thank you, dear traveler, for joining me on this deep dive to Monticello. I highly recommend Monticello for you and your family. You will leave with a broader perspective of what it was like to live on a plantation in Virginia at that time. Please smack that bell and subscribe to my page and check out my latest video that I uploaded on Farmville, a great little Virginia town with wonderful shopping, food, and two universities. Until that time, this is Robin on the Road, your concierge for all things travel, and I hope to see you on the road again. Until then, safe travels.